My name is Michael McNeil. I'm from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, we are partners with USAID and collaborating with NREL on this presentation. We are implementing partners for the Energy Efficiency for Development Program at USAID. In this presentation, we'll be talking about bottom-up energy demand modeling for planning. And specifically, we'll be covering um, a couple of our bottom-up models at the lab, uh, the Buenos and Dream models. The presentation outline will be first to give some basic background on bottom-up modeling, what it's for and what exactly that means. Then I will go into some detail about our Buenos model and how we built it and what is some of the examples of it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about specific data needs for bottom-up modeling uh, because that's an, an important factor to consider before uh, launching a modeling program of this type. Um, then I will move into some of the more advanced applications that we have um, <clears throat> developed within our dream modeling framework. And finally, I will give a couple of case studies about how we've used these models. So first of all, um, generally, uh, I'd like to address uh, what bottom-up bottom modeling is and what kinds of things it can tell us as energy planners. First of all, uh, a definition. Um, in bottom-up modeling, the understanding of future energy demand is built up from uses of energy in distinct sectors. That means knowing specifically about things like how buildings and industry use energy and even further drill down to energy services within those sectors. So that means things like lighting, heating, and mechanical energy that usually passes through motors. So one of the main reasons why you would go to a bottom-up modeling scheme is to improve accuracy. Bottom-up modeling increases accuracy in several ways. First of all, um, bottom-up modeling allows you to see structural change over time. That means shifts between sectors and economic, um, how economic, econ e the economy and energy is decoupled over time as the economy changes. Second of all, second of all it helps us understand saturation effects. That means that once an energy need is satisfied, growth slows in that area. So a very typical example of this is that um, as household income increases, more households will purchase and use refrigerators. But generally speaking, uh, people only need one refrigerator. So at some point, um, that energy use stops growing. And then finally, it improves accuracy by understanding technological trends. Technology creates new uses sometimes, but it can also improve efficiency. So a, a really good example of this is the general um, transition throughout the world from incandescent lamps for lighting to CFLs and LEDs has really um, reduced the intensity of electricity for lighting. Second of all, bottom-up modeling allows us to have disaggregated results. So it's not only that we, we have a more accurate uh, result, but we can see more detail in those results. So first of all, we'll see, we can see the, the, the total energy consumption from all sectors and all end uses, but um, we can also see things like the peak electricity load. So it's not only how much electricity we're using overall, but we can see when we're using electricity. And that has a very strong impact on how many power plants need to be built, and therefore the capital inputs for that for the power sector. Finally, um, we can see changes and shifts and trends in sector behavior. And a classical example of this is that, um, generally speaking, um, the residential sector households are, are, are a big and growing user of electricity. But over time, as the service sector develops and in the economy, you start seeing much more electricity being used by commercial buildings. And we can we can tease out those those effects through bottom up modeling. 
Next, I want to say something about the time dependence that comes uh, from bottom-up modeling. Bottom-up modeling acts importantly at two very different time scales. First of all, um, through what we call load modeling. Load modeling is understanding how all the energy, particularly electricity, loads add up to create peaks and valleys in demand by the hour of the day and month of the year. So certain uses are uh, peaking at certain times of the day or the evening. For example, uh, lighting is much obviously much high, more intensive at night. Um, and it can also include seasonal effects. In temperate regions, you'll have a much different profile of energy use in winter and summer. The second time scale is <clears throat> what we call forecasting. And that means predicting how energy evolves over years and decades. Um, for most economies, um, there's a growth path. This means that energy use is, is just constantly increasing over time. And so we, we want to see how that, that happens. And because we're talking about power sector planning here, it's uh, the time scale of, of, of decades is, is what's relevant. Finally, and importantly, we use bottom-up modeling because it allows us insights in, into policy analysis. So because of the details that you have in the results, bottom-up modeling can be more helpful in assessing the impact of energy policies, which generally affect specific sectors, for example, construction or equipment types through efficiency standards. Efficiency policies generally don't act on the economy as a whole, but on these specific sectors. So only by modeling the specific sectors can you see their likely impact over time. Now I'd like to talk about some basic components of energy demand. And this is sort of the building blocks of how we build these models. Bottom-up energy demand modeling takes as a starting point that energy demand is driven by three main components. And these are expressed by the so-called Kaya identity, which was a relationship that was developed in the early years of um, long-term modeling to understand climate mitigation. In this equation, we have activity, intensity, and efficiency that make up the energy demand. Activity is a basic element of what happens in an economy and can be as varied as population growth, um, production of uh, basic commodities and heavy industry like steel or cement, um, what the service sector um, contribution to the economy and GDP is. It can be something like how many what, kilometers traveled by people in personal cars. All kinds of things contribute to this to, to drive the basic use of energy. Intensity tells us how much useful energy is needed for each unit of activity. So for example, for each uh, unit of, of an industrial product, how much heat in industrial processes are used. Um, it can be something like in a commercial building, how much air conditioner uh, energy is used, how much, how much cooling and lighting are there. Um, and of course, in the household sector, it's your basic uses like lighting, refrigeration, cooling, etc. So finally, in the denominator of this equation, uh, we have efficiency. So efficiency is the amount of energy inputs needed to produce a unit of useful energy. Um, so you're using the energy to get an energy service, but how much inputs do you have to put into that? Efficiency is highly specific to the end use and can vary dramatically according to the technology. It is also one of the areas most directly affected by government policy. Generally, bottom-up modeling takes activity as an exogenous input, sometimes with multiple scenarios. So what that means is that um, your energy policy isn't going to determine um, population growth. It's not going to determine um, economic growth very much. Um, and it's probably not going to determine how much mobility people need. So those are things that we take as a given, although we usually have some sort of scenarios to take into account things like variable economic growth. Um, and <clears throat> intensity is a little bit uh, more driven by 
um, trends. We see uh, um, that over time, um, households like to have more services, uh, energy services, as they uh, grow in income and there's uh, um, commercial buildings become more highly cooled, things like that. So finally, the energy efficiency uh, is what we call the control variable when we do our modeling. Generally, our scenarios are energy efficiency scenarios. And by adjusting these parameters in a very specific way, um, we can forecast the, the impacts of government policies on future energy demand. So that's a very important uh, aspect of our modeling. Large scale models of energy demand have historically um, been concerned about forecasting energy demand on the scale of years and decades into the future. Um, so as I mentioned, a, a good example of this is um, the energy models that were developed to try to under, better understand greenhouse gas um, emissions from energy and possibilities for, for mitigating them. But increasingly, uh, what we are calling advanced bottom-up models also are concerned about timescales of hours and days in order to accomplish load modeling. And I'll say more about that in the following slide. Here I'd like to um, make a, a note about um, data needs because this is an important issue um, and the need to establish a technology database. So um, although as I've described, bottom of modeling has some significant advantages over top-down modeling, it can be more, much more data intensive and that's something that should be kept in mind. So some, here's some of the examples of data that are needed to model electricity demand in particular in a model. Um, in terms of activity data, these are sort of a, some of the usual um, suspects like population growth, um, uh, GDP, um, number of households, which is related to population, of course, but has a demographic component to it as well. But there's also things like commercial building floor space. Um, which is a very important parameter that is often um, not very easy to find. Um, and then there are, are things like equipment sales and construction. So by that, I mean, how many refrigerators are being sold in the country every year? Um, and how is that growing? And then uh, how many new buildings, both residential and commercial are being built every year? In terms of intensity data, we're talking about appliance ownership. Um, what percentage of households own a refrigerator or an air conditioner? And this usually comes from government surveys. Um, they can be a standard of living surveys, or at times they're um, surveys specifically to assess energy use. Um, data such as how much air conditioning is there being used in, in commercial buildings? So this depends on the grade of the commercial building, but it also just determines on, it is determined by um, custom or, or, or usage, you know, how much cooling are, are people accustomed to. Um, heating and refrigeration and lighting intensity uh, are important intensity factors. Um, the size of equipment, generally we see that um, Refrigerators and, and air conditioners get larger, <laughs> not smaller over time. And then finally, uh, for some equipment like air conditioners, how often do people actually use them? And then finally, there's efficiency data. This is generally speaking a very technical data set. Um, there are overall trends and technologies, um, as I mentioned before, um, such as the phase out of, of incandescent lamps but then at a more detailed level, um, there are the technical, te technical characteristics of um, appliances being sold in the country. And this is often only really determinable through a testing um, program, some sort of efficiency monitoring program. So um, collecting all this data is a main component of the effort of building a model. 
It requires working closely with people um, that are working and familiar with the, the markets in the country, as well as literature um, from uh, people in universities um, and um, all kinds of surveys, industri industry market reports. Um, increasingly, you can gain a lot of information from online retailers, people selling appliances on the internet, and then finally, dedicated industry assessment. So the final you know, takeaway from this is that, of course, the quality of the output of a bottom-up model depends critically on the quality of input. Next, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about our um, the original model that we built to uh, forecast electricity demand, specifically um, for um, equipment uh, used in households, commercial buildings, and industry. We call this Buenos 1.0. So um, according to the definitions that I just give, gave, it's important to clarify that this version of Buenos um, was a forecasting model. That means that we were concerned with the time scale of years. Um, it did not give us load modeling information, which is um, energy or electricity demand on the time scale of hours. Um, uh, later versions of the model do do that, and I'll get to those later in the talk. By the early 2000s, there were a couple of um, key energy demand modeling needs that were emerging. First of all, um, global climate change was, you know, increasingly seen as a major issue for energy policy, and so um, countries throughout the world needed accurate assessments of, of the energy-driven emissions, um, particularly in the time frame of where we are now, 2020, 2030, and beyond. Um, second, at the same time, um, energy efficiency policy was spreading around the globe. So um, the United States and the European Union had a long history of, of strong energy efficiency policies, but this was also being rapidly adopted, particularly in large developing countries, but, but even um, in, in many other countries. And we wanted to know um, what the impacts of that, those policies could be. Specifically, uh, we built the model because we were asked, what is the total global potential of energy efficiency policies in the context of climate change around the world? So we built this model and we called it the um, bottom-up energy analysis system, or Buenos. And we, we built it for as many countries as we could find information for. And we ran um, three specific scenarios. First of all, we ran what we call the recent achievements uh, scenario. And this, we calculated the impact of recently implemented minimum energy performance standards and labels. So of the many countries that had um, adopted this important type of program, we wanted to know uh, how much impact had those actions already had. And it's important to remember that uh, impact of, of policies um, that were implemented in the year 2005 have impacts through 2030 in this case. So it was a forward-looking um, impact analysis of some policies that had already been implemented. Second, um, we calculated a cost-effective potential scenario. Um, and in this, we asked the basic question that if every country that we were modeling adopted policies that implemented all of the cost-effective energy efficiency improvements, what would be the long-term impact? And just a note about this, this required even more data that I described um, in the previous slides because it required us to know what the different costs of different energy efficiency technologies were by country. Finally, 
we created a, uh, 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 an ambitious scenario. What is the, the total potential of um, policies if all countries on our list adopted um, the best available technology um, where available means that um, these were um, products that were not necessarily demonstrably cost effective right now, but were available on the market at the time of the analysis. So this uh, graphic on the right side shows the results of all of these. And you see that um, the impacts are measured in hundreds of terawatt hours. So um, these are really quite large impacts. But because it was a bottom-up detailed model, we could see the differential um, impact of addressing different types of, of uh, energy users. And it's notable here that um, room air conditioners, which are generally residential air conditioning products, rose to the top with more than 300 terawatt hours potential in the best available technology here. So since this time, our Buenos model has merged with other modeling efforts throughout our international energy analysis department in a program that we call um, the Demand Resources Energy Analysis Model or DREAM. And so in the next few slides, I'll, uh, I will, um, I will, I will um, come back to talking a little bit about the advancements made in DREAM. First, though, I'd like to um, uh, show you uh, a, a, an example of the applications of Buenos. So we originally made Buenos to be a global model um, to cover as many countries as we can. But of course, it had the ability to drill down and focus on specific uh, countries. And so um, we built some several <clears throat> versions of the model for individual countries. Uh, within dedicated programs um, where we worked very closely with government officials and experts in those countries to um, develop the most accurate model possible. Example of this is uh, work we did together with the South Africa Department of Energy. Now, the South Africa Department of Energy had launched an energy efficiency program. They had, it had gotten started and was active for about 10 years. And they asked for help um, in understanding the current potential for further energy efficiency standards for residential appliances. So we worked closely with them. Um, we collected a lot of data on appliance ownership, appliance sales, the use patterns of different appliances. And we were able to feed all of this as a, you know, specific South Africa database into the Buenos model and run our scenarios. So that model found that there are major additional savings still to be had by ratcheting energy efficiency standards for appliances in South Africa. Um, we were able to determine that um, there were some priority products, specifically water heaters, electric water heaters, and refrigerators followed by by AC. Um, I'd just like to comment that refrigerators and air conditioners generally show up on a high priority list. South Africa was interesting because uh, the electric water heaters um, was a particularly um, high uh, electricity user, unusually so, and also um, at a very low technology baseline. So it really afforded a great deal of improvement. So this, at the end of the day, this analysis supported not only um, a way to prioritize which products the South Africa Department of Energy should focus on, but we were also able to uh, do cost benefit analysis for those products, which helped them actually set the standards for uh, many appliances. Next, I'd like to drill down a little bit on some of the methodology of how we built these models. Um, 
and some of the components that need to be uh, put into place. I'd like to talk a little bit about residential sector activity modeling. <clears throat> so large scale growth in electricity demand is usually driven by uptake of electrical equipment and household. That's, a, that's usually the first step. As you see, a, as um, households um, become wealthier, they buy more appliances and you see you know, really strong growth in uh, electricity demand in the residential sector. Um, at some point that, that those tend to saturate and then you see um, more growth in the commercial building sector, but it usually starts out in the residential sector. Um, appliance acquisition uh, naturally follows a sort of a, a, a ladder. Um, first of all, when um, households are first electrified, they get connected to the grid. The first thing that they will uh, generally start using is lighting and televisions come very soon after the first light bulb you find. I would say um, more recently, this is probably also um, complemented by cell phone chargers and other small electronics. Um, then as the households gain more income, on average, um, refrigeration is you know, a very high priority, but refrigerators are not cheap, so it takes some, some, you know, some amount of resources before refrigerators can be purchased. And then it may be a cooking appliance, clothes washing, um, and then at the same time, you see the appearance of electronic devices and small appliances like blenders, rice cookers, et cetera. Um, the average household income is, is always the main driver of increased ownership of appliances in our experience. But of course, trends like urbanization, people moving to the city, and you know, higher levels of, of grid connection or, or what we call electrification also have an impact aside from that. Finally, I'd like to make a uh, comment about air conditioners. Um, increasingly, we find that air conditioners are very important driver of electricity consumption in the household sector. Of course, um, air conditioners are not seen as necessary as refrigeration, and uh, generally speaking, air conditioners are kind of expensive. So what you see is a long, slow lead up time before um, you have significant amounts of air conditioner uptake, but then we generally see, we've seen in, in several countries, a rapid increase in, in ownership that really drives growth of the entire sector. On the right hand side, this, this graph is a, uh, um, a model, one of our older models um, based on India. Um, on the X axis, you see the average household income from a income survey. And on the Y axis, you see the penetration level of these different appliances. So you can really clearly see um, how um, appliance ownership is growing as a function of income. Next, I'd like to drill down a little bit more on this subject because it's quite important. Um, in order to develop our global model, we needed a way to understand in a, in a generic way how appliance uh, ownership, or what we call saturation, increases with these different parameters. And so we were able to, um, through statistical methods, um, determine, isolate some key variables um, uh, that, that drive the uptake of, of most appliances. And what really rose to the top was um, household income and the electric, electrification rate. In other cases, we also had a uh, an appliance, what we call an appliance specific variable. And this usually means um, climate. So obviously air conditioner uptake is, is, is driven um, very strongly by the, the climate, the local climate. So uh, we included that. So the, the, the equation on the right is a, is a standard logistic function. This gives you a, uh, an S curve. On the, on the graphic of the left, you kind of see what that the shape of that curve looks like. So um, with um, large, relatively large data sets from, taken from surveys in many countries, we were able to 
sort of generically um, model appliance ownership. So um, now in, in, in recent versions of the model, there's, there's really two ways that we, that we model uptake and the total stock or number of appliances at any given time. The first is, is what I just described, which is called you know, econometric modeling based on macroeconomic trends. But also, um, if you have recent trends of how many um, appliances were in you know, the average household at a certain time, say from a, a survey taken, and you can combine that with um, good data um, on sales of products, like I said, if you have data on um, the number of refrigerators that are sold every year and what the trend is, you can also use that to forecast appliance ownership. Here, I'd just like to quickly um, give an example of what, the, what a, the, the kind of technology database um, that we have built and what needs to be built for this model. So this is covering a, a large number of countries. This is for our global model, um, but it's relevant for you know, each working on an individual country. So on the, um, the columns on the left, you see uh, we're covering the residential sector, um, commercial buildings, and also industry. And, and for us, um, industry is, is mostly um, industrial motors and distribution transformers because these are um, very well-defined um, self-contained technologies um, that get shipped and can be regulated. We didn't cover um, the larger industrial processes of, of heavy industry. And the residential sector, you know, is where we have the largest disaggregation of different end uses. And, and you can see, I won't go through all of them, but you can see that there's, you know, quite a few things to consider. Um, and in the commercial sector, it's more about general energy uses like cooling, air conditioning, lighting, refrigeration, and space heating. So for each of these cases, it's important to understand, you know, as we go back to the, the original identity, of activity, intensity, and efficiency. Or, so for each one of them, we want to know um, how um, prevalent the use is. Um, and we want to know generally how big the appliances are that are being used. And then how often they're being used. And then finally, something about the efficiency technical specifications. So um, it's quite a lot. Um, it's not um, impossible um, to get all of these data points, um, particularly if you're looking at um, really just a few end uses that are taking up the bulk of the energy demand. Next, I'd like to talk about, so that, so that, that was our, our forecasting model and the scenarios that we, um, built with it and the kind of data needs and methodologies. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what we call advanced modeling. Um, now we're transitioning to uh, the framework of our, our dream model. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've tried to, to expand on, on Buenos to achieve. So um, <clears throat> several years ago, um, we asked ourselves uh, an important question. We had done a fairly decent job of, of building models to project overall energy demand and related greenhouse gas emissions over the next 20 or 30 years. But we asked ourselves, what if the major concern of the government that we're working with isn't fuel inputs or emissions, um, but they're facing a need to uh, rapidly build up um, electricity generation capacity, um, and that's going to cost billions of dollars. What if that's the most important issue that they have? What are the modeling needs for that situation? So 
Buenos was able to, to, to forecast <coughs> electricity consumption of major equipment and sectors um, and associate um, these with greenhouse gas emissions and, and run policy scenarios of how to save electricity overall. So that was our starting point. Um, but given that there was this new question that we wanted to address, um, this led to what I would call our first steps in advanced modeling. So in that, in the advanced model, we want to characterize electricity loads over hours of the day throughout the year. Um, so this is load modeling. Um, we want to model the growth and changes in the shape of the hour load over a 20 year time scale. So we want to take that snapshot of what the, um, the load, the overall grid load looks like on a time scale of hours and forecast to 20 years in the future. And then finally, we want to build new um, scenarios that prioritize energy efficiency policies to target peak load and thereby reduce the need to power plants. So our first um, attempt at this was to build a model for um, peak load for Indonesia. And we've also looked at some specific cases in Mexico, and, I, uh, and I'll uh, talk about those a little bit. So for the Indonesia case study, the approach we took was to combine the original model that we had, the Buenos uh, forecasting model, with a load module um, shown here as a, the orange square called load M. And in that module, we would bring in the load shape of each end use in each sector and combine them. And so the results that we would get out of this would be daily load curves by each sector and end use, and critically, what the peak load is. And this will be forecast over a long time period. Here's what this looks like graphically. In the upper left graph, this is our general standard results from Buenos. So you see that we've got all of the main uh, end uses broken out. And these were what we found to be the most important end uses, electricity end uses in Indonesia. And we're able to forecast them out to 2030. So you can see um, this is the electricity sector business as usual case. You can see that without any additional policies, what we predicted um, the overall electricity used to be. And not surprisingly, you see a huge amount of growth here. And this is mostly driven in Indonesia by the residential sector, by, by uh, economic growth and, and households having more um, disposable income to buy appliances and, and use energy. Next, we combine that with load shapes for uh, a load profile for each one of the end uses. So this uh, graph on the upper right shows typical um, load profiles throughout the day for each one of these uh, residential end uses. And it's important to note that this data did not all come from Indonesia was not available. So there are some proxy data here. So for example, we had air conditioning profile data from, from India that we applied here. Obviously, uh, we would like to continue to refine this and, uh, um, and um, use uh, spe country specific load profiles. Um, unfortunately, in many cases, that requires actually making measurements because these, these load profiles don't always exist for every end use in every country. But anyway, you can see the general load shapes here. Um, we have um, the, in particular, the orange line is air conditioners. And you can see that um, it starts out that people are using air conditioners um, in the very early morning hours. And then air conditioning use drops almost to zero by 9 a.m. And then it starts growing at 5 p.m. and reaches a peak at about um, 9 p.m. Um, what this, what our interpretation of this is that um, during the middle of the day, 
um, people aren't home or not everyone is home and they don't use the air conditioner. When they come home in the evening, it's hot and humid and they turn on the air conditioners and they actually leave it on um, for most of the night. And uh, what we've understood in this, in this case and in other, other countries is that, of course, um, people turn on air conditioning so that they can sleep and they, and they, and they generally leave it on all night. The other major um, really um, strongly peaked in use, of course, is lighting. So um, you see, you see the lighting is the blue um, <clears throat> uh, curve there, and you can really clearly see when it gets dark and people turn on the lights, and then as they go to bed, they turn off the lights. And then finally, interestingly, the television curve also turned out to be very strongly peaked with people coming home watching television in the evening. When you take these two um, pictures separately and you combine them, you get the lower graph. And so now <clears throat> this um, graph is, is, is a snapshot of, of what we think the load profile is going to look like in the year 2030. So we forecast in the future, and mostly that means strong growth of many end uses. In particular, we see very strong growth in air conditioners. The air conditioner ownership rate in Indonesia in our base year of 2010 was very low, but all indications tell us that that's going to grow quite rapidly. And so this has a very strongly peaked end use. You see um, the, the area under directly under the peak from air conditioning is, is quite large. And we were able to combine that with, you know, all, treat all the end uses like this. But that really shows you what stands out from a peak load perspective. Um, it's really the air conditioning uh, use and also lighting. Um, I should also mention that underneath this, this graph shows the other sectors as well. Underneath it, you see a commercial building um, load and an, an industrial load under that. And, and those we treated as whole sectors with certain um, load shapes that generally just grow over time with um, the component of um, GDP that corresponds to those sectors. So, a few conclusions about this um, hybrid modeling that we that we did for Indonesia. Um, we were able to show that if no mitigating steps were taken, not only would overall electricity consumption grow, but specifically peak electricity demand, means the the electricity at the highest point of the day would more than triple by 2030. And in the context of that country, what that means is an additional 50 gigawatts of power plant capacity. Um, or we like to use, you know, as a, as a, as a general um, marker that you have a very large um, coal or natural gas burning power plant, it's about 500 megawatts. So we're talking about 100 new, very large power plants. And that would cost society the government investment or, or borrowing capacity or society as a whole tens of billions of, of US dollars. That's what, if, if nothing is, is done to mitigate that, that growth in the peak load. Second, we found that air conditioners, which were owned by only a small percentage of households today, are expected to grow dramatically as incomes grow, creating the single largest component of load on the peak by 2030. So we, first of all, this exploding growth in air conditioning is not unique to Indonesia, of course. We see this in many, many countries um, in warm climates. Um, but it's a real qualitative change in the structure of the electricity load from something where there's very little air conditioning right now to where we would expect it just to be the single largest peak load in 2030. Finally, we ran our energy efficiency scenario. Um, we took the, the case of, just, just talking about the case of um, the, the aggressive, ambitious scenario of best available technology, we found that basic minimum energy performance standards, which are you know, quite um, well understood and, and applied throughout the world, for just residential products 
household appliances and lighting could mitigate this peak demand growth um, by 26 and a half gigawatts. So we're talking about 50 large power plants that wouldn't have to be built. And we thought that was really quite a interesting result. Now, now we're talking about many tens of billions of, of dollars worth of capital investment that could be avoided. So the takeaway from this is first of all that what we're calling the advanced bottom energy, bottom up energy demand modeling allows a higher resolution insights into national financial benefits. So this this result of number of power plants we just we really couldn't say before we developed the the, the uh, load modeling component of the model. But what's the next step? From here, what are the other questions that we would like to answer with this type of modeling? Um, one obvious one is, um, since we know that the cost of delivering electricity is variable throughout the day, then it leads to questions of how does peak load mitigation impact utility finance? In other words, if we can develop policies that shape the load and reduce the peak load, how does that provide a net financial benefit to often strapped um, large electric utilities? And then secondly, another in, in important um, aspect of this is if you're developing a renewable uh, electricity resource um, because of uh, climate change considerations and other considerations, how does energy efficiency now interact with the renewable portfolio? And I'll just give a quick example of this in the next slide. This is an example from, from Mexico. Um, and what when we started to look into this question of renewable integration, um, it's important to know that Mexico has had a very ambitious plans for rapidly increasing the renewable electricity production in the country over the next 20 years. And secondly, that most of that renewable resource in Mexico is solar, which is produced in the daytime, of course. So what we wanted to do is, 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 is to compare the time profile of the resource with the current load and, and look at some mitigation um, possibilities. So I'm going to show three different graphs here. On the left side, we have basically just what the, um, the uh, system load looks like now. So on the x-axis, you have hours of the day. Um, and we divided it up between winter and summer. So the solid area is winter. And then the, 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 the line is summer. And you can see um, just in a very general way that there's a huge component from air conditioning in the country because the, you know, the, the overall load grows <coughs> very strongly. But also you can see that there's something going on in the way that the load is distributed over time. So in the, in the, in the winter solid area, you see where the, 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 the peak is from, from lighting. Um, but in the summer, you have two distinct peaks, and neither one of them are coincident with the lighting peak. And what we think that this is, is we think in the daytime, in the middle of the day at about 4 p.m., this is a commercial building air conditioning or cooling peak. Um, but at nighttime, um, closer to midnight, you have a second um, equally high residential cooling peak. So we wanted to verify that. And this middle graph here is a result of a, a measurement study that, that we um, actually collaborated with USAID on, where we went into uh, households in the hottest region of Mexico and measured when they use their air conditioning. So this is just the, the usage of an individual air conditioning unit in Northern Mexico. And what you see very clearly is, um, maybe not surprisingly, um, just like we saw in the Indonesia case, um, people are, are using their air conditioners very strongly late at night. So that confirms to us that this overall peak that you see in the um, grid profile is <clears throat> uh, coming from residential air conditioning, and it happens about midnight. 
And the last graph is just, you know, uh, uh, a snapshot of what the, the solar resource is expected to, I mean, the uh, renewable resource is expected to look like. And of course, since it's mostly driven by solar, it strongly peaked in the middle of the day and then drops off quite rapidly so that at midnight or so, it's <clears throat> relatively low. Um, this is all the, the, the analysis we were able to do uh, to date on Mexico, but the, the basic conclusion that you can easily draw from this is that um, air conditioning loads can be um, not well correlated to renewable resource loads. So what that would mean is if you're developing, if you want your uh, renewable resource portfolio to be as effective as possible, it really behooves you to uh, focus strongly on air conditioner efficiency. So what are some general takeaways <clears throat> from this discussion? Um, so first, you know, just to um, divide between what we call standard bottom-up demand modeling and advanced bottom-up energy demand modeling. In the, the standard bottom-up energy demand <clears throat> modeling, you it, it is remains an important tool to understand dynamics of economic development and greenhouse gas emissions. And how technologies are evolving over time. Um, and we would say that it's necessary to take a bottom-up approach to prioritize and design good energy efficiency policies because it's only in bottom-up modeling that you get that level of detail where policy actually acts. And then finally, there are very well-established methodologies and multiple platforms um, that are available for bottom-up energy demand modeling. Um, but Importantly, I, I, I would like to emphasize that it, it is more data intensive. And so it requires that analysts building models work closely with local officials and experts to develop the data. I would say that if you're building a bottom-up model or planning, at least half of the effort needs to be focused on good data collection. So secondly, what does advanced bottom-up energy demand modeling give us in addition to this? Um, in order to answer questions about renewable energy integration, um, the need for capital investments and utility financial viability, and there, there are more, there are others definitely, um, such as um, integration of electric vehicle fleets and, and the, the grid. Um, Bottom-up models will need to cover this time scale of hours of the day, as well as years and decades into the future. And so finally, the, the the, the comment I'd like to leave you with is that, of course, energy demand models can adapt to particular needs uh, of a country. And of course, they, they should. They really have to. The first step um, should be the assessment of the particular uh, context of, that, of, of the country before starting on a modeling effort. So on that note, um, as, I, as I mentioned, that analysis is not a one-size-fits-all enterprise. Um, the questions for um, participants are some of them here. I, there could be many others. But some of the, the most important are, what are the most important goals or factors in, in electricity planning? In other words, um, why are you doing the, the electricity planning? And the answer could uh, vary. Um, depending on which part of the government um, you are sitting in. Um, we would like to think that in the best cases, you have multiple um, agencies and, and multiple um, needs coming together in a single consistent model. But some of the questions uh, that you might be uh, um, most concerned with are, of course, wh how, what, are, wh what are the best ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to uh, comply with um, nationally determined contributions that are already committed to or um, to uh, create a, 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 an effective update to those. Uh, second, how much um, power plant construction are you looking at and, and what are um, strategies to avoid massive um, public sector investments in them? 
in addition to that, if you're a, if you're a, um, importing fuels to drive your electricity production, this is of course a very um, important issue of, of energy security. Um, this renewable resource question, if you already have plans to um, increase the renewable electricity production in the country, um, what are the best ways to actually match future loads to that resource? Um, how can you reduce the cost? What are the costs of, of operating on the peak um, versus um, operating in the base load um, aside from you know, power plant construction and how can you um, optimize that, I guess I would say. And through that, how can you improve the utility financial viability? And this is a, a level of analysis of, of really understanding what are the financial flows uh, of the utility that, and how are they dependent on where, the, where in the day the load is. So a second level question, of course, is what level of modeling is already done? Um, we find that uh, it's unusual that people haven't done any type of modeling. And can you use the existing models and extend them to, to better answer some of these questions? In other words, can the bottom up modeling um, methodologies here be integrated into existing, uh, you know, well established models? <clears throat> and then finally, again, back to the data question, what is the status of data needed to build the bottom up model? Um, are there household surveys? Um, are they relatively recent? Um, and how detailed are they? Is a you know first question to uh, to to ask yourself in in looking at building a bottom up model. Um, do existing government and industry programs monitor appliance market? So in other words, is there maybe a labeling program or a testing program where it's able where where you're able to um, understand um, what is the baseline level of of efficiency for for um, household appliances and other equipment. And finally, is there data about the variable cost of electricity production and delivery? And this gets back to this, this uh, utility financial variability question. Are you able to say at each point of the day um, what the cost of production of electricity is? Because if you can correlate that to demand, and you can correlate it to mitigation of demand, then you could really generate some powerful results about financial benefit. So um, we'll stop there. Um, and finally, um, I'd just like to leave you with uh, some further reading. This is mostly um, documentation about some of these, the, the models that, that we've done, but there's some uh, references to the work of, of others. And of course, um, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have about um, any of these models, uh, looking forward to, um, how to how to build them, um, and any questions about this talk that you have. So thank you very much.